Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. Tonight, the race to chase down chains of transmission in Nova Scotia. The virus is spreading and we have to find a way to contain it. Nova Scotia breaks a pandemic record and cracks down. Plus, as vaccine lineups stretch around the block in Ontario's hotspots, the call from some experts to focus firepower. The system has been prioritizing certain lives over others. It's one of the most damning things that I've ever seen in my career. Should Ontario change up where they send vaccines? Also tonight, in-game purchases turn huge profits for video game makers. Are they driving gambling addictions? I was spending probably 80 pounds in one night. Go Public has insider documents showing the push to get players to go all in. Win number 10. And Canada's most successful golfer hits a new milestone. This is the National. Tonight, as more than 4,000 Canadians are being treated in hospital for COVID-19, overwhelming health care workers in parts of the country, two provinces stand out for concerns over rising numbers. Nova Scotia reporting 63 new cases, a significant number in a small province, topping a record from nearly one year ago and triggering sharp new measures, including a doubling of fines. In Alberta, what's causing alarm is the steadily growing burden on intensive care, as cases show no signs of slowing down. Per capita, Alberta has more new COVID cases than anywhere else. But let's begin in Nova Scotia, where officials say they are worried. As Matt Damour shows us, officials are cracking down quickly to try to stop the spread. The line for a COVID-19 test snaked around the Halifax Convention Centre today. For those in the queue, the wait was worth it. Uh, just to be safe, just with the uptick in cases, it probably made sense. Like over 100 in the last two days, made just to protect myself and those around me. The province reported 63 new cases Sunday. That's the highest daily number since the start of the pandemic, and it prompted a rare Sunday news conference from Premier Ian Rankin. It's a disappointing weekend for us. There are potential exposure sites in more than 20 communities. They include restaurants, bars, grocery stores, and public transit, and are spread throughout the province. While the majority of cases are in Halifax area, it is now spread to every region of the province. The virus is spreading and we have to find a way to contain it. Nova Scotia is tightening restrictions. Officials are telling people not to travel outside their communities unless it's for work or medical appointments. We need all Nova Scotians to know how serious our situation is. And I expect high numbers in the next few days. To bring those numbers down, a new limit of 10 people for gatherings outside Halifax. The rule is still five inside the city. But after police handed out 22 tickets to partygoers at one Halifax home Friday night, the fine has been doubled to $2,000. Dalhousie University confirmed some attendees may have been students and the school is considering suspensions. Make no mistake, this is a serious situation with lives, jobs and futures at stake. Each of us needs to respond with a necessary focus and caution. As Nova Scotia tries to rein in its surge in new cases, some hospitals have cancelled some elective procedures in order to build capacity for the thousands of COVID tests now underway. Matt Damour, CBC News, Montreal. Now to Alberta, where intensive care units are approaching the peaks they saw during the last wave. Today, we learned around 60% of new cases involve those potentially more severe variants. Erin Broman shows us how it threatens to push the province to its limit. It's deja vu inside Alberta hospitals. Exponential community spread, driving hundreds of patients into hospital beds. Is this is our third way we should be better at this by now. We know what works in order to mitigate the, the, the numbers. We know that it takes good government policies. Alberta's daily case rate this week was the worst in the country by far. And healthcare workers say hospitals are going to shoulder that burden. As of today, 600 people were in hospital, 140 in intensive care. Numbers approaching the heights of the second wave. We are going to exceed uh, last the last wave for ICU uh, by, by a large number. And the only thing that's going to limit that is the announcement of new restrictions. The last round of restrictions brought in early this month banned dine-in service and put caps on business. 
On Friday, Alberta's health minister said they won't rule out more. Our leaders should lead. These case numbers are fueled by variants. The majority of patients in Alberta hospitals have the B117 variant, first discovered in the UK. We're starting to now see people in their 20s, 30s and 40s, you know, presenting with severe COVID-19 and facing the real proposition of needing to be placed on a ventilator to save their life. In tourist popular but tiny Banff, with cases soaring, locals are calling for a targeted solution. Residents want all adults vaccinated. We're fighting against the virus coming from all places in Alberta. It's just not fair. It's a small community. We have, you know, only so many resources. And Alberta hospitals are in the same boat. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. Ontario continues to transfer dozens of patients across the province as hospitals in some areas struggle to keep up. Some help, though, is on the way from Atlantic Canada. Newfoundland and Labrador's Premier Andrew Fury, himself a doctor, recently promised Doug Ford that he'd be sending frontline health workers. And today he tweeted this update. Details are coming together for healthcare professionals heading to Ontario. Looks like they'll be on their way Tuesday. And that help is desperately needed as Ontario sets a new record for intensive care patients today. 851 people are now in provincial ICUs as the crisis in hospitals worsens. The call to help those most at risk is growing louder. As Talia Ricci shows us, experts say Ontario should consider sending half its vaccines to the areas most acutely affected. These doctors, nurses and other health workers kept their demonstration short today. They don't want to be gathering but feel they have no other choice. Stop playing politics with people's lives. Outside of the provincial legislature, the health care workers demanded employer paid sick days and prioritizing essential workers in marginalized communities in the vaccine rollout. People are dying. And that's why we're out here and that's why we're asking for these specific measures that we know is based in evidence. The number of patients in Ontario ICUs with COVID-19 has been steadily increasing, reaching a record high each day for the past 19 days. We're seeing people in the waiting room who, who should be in the ICU. Vaccines. I want vaccines like tomorrow. I want vaccines immediately. So do the hundreds of residents who have been spending hours waiting in lineups like this one in Downsview, a Toronto COVID-19 hotspot. We just like lined up early, hoping that, you know, we, they haven't ran out of vaccines. Right now, a quarter of the province's vaccines go to hotspots. On Friday, Ontario's COVID-19 science advisory table said that number should go up to 50%, saying it would reduce case counts, hospitalizations and deaths. I would actually push even further or reframe the science table's recommendation and say, how comfortable are we allowing to continue to see people die and suffer? in these neighborhoods. These are our newest Canadians, our racialized Canadians, um, and to the extent that those structural inequities existed even before the pandemic, I think the pandemic simply uh, uh, worsened them. Doctors know it'll be a while before they see relief. I have never been more anxious in this pandemic un until like this wave. Last week, Premier Doug Ford promised a paid sick leave program is coming. His office says they'll have more to say about it in the coming days. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. With variants driving Canada's third wave, some premiers are calling for tighter border restrictions. Today, the Deputy Prime Minister, Christopher Freeland, addressed the issue on Rosie Barton Live. We're reviewing the data. We're talking to scientists all the time. We are talking to premiers across the country, constantly looking to see if there's more we should be doing. This week, Canada suspended direct flights from India and Pakistan. Four provinces are now reporting cases of the contagious so-called variant of interest first identified in India. Tonight, Ottawa said it would support the people of India if the country asks for foreign aid as the COVID crisis spirals. For the fourth straight day, India set a global record for new cases, more than 349,000. What that actually looks like on the ground is chaotic, heartbreaking and difficult to watch. A warning as Briar Stewart brings us those scenes and the worry of family members here in Canada. In this temple parking lot on the outskirts of Delhi, a desperate attempt to save those with nowhere else to go. This woman has stopped breathing. Oxygen is brought out and volunteers start CPR. 
Inside each of these cars is someone gasping for air. And it's a similar scene outside many of the overwhelmed hospitals. We need oxygen immediately. There is no help, no hope. Families, even hospital staff, are lining up trying to secure a potentially life-saving supply of oxygen. Oxygen ka cylinder black me this man paid more than $500 U.S. for a canister on the black market yesterday for his 70-year-old father. It's now empty. Oxygen and other medical supplies are starting to be shipped in from Asia and Europe. And today the U.S. said it would be sending India the raw materials to produce more vaccines. But it's all too late for the thousands now dying daily. Admits the anguish is a palpable anger. I am totally disheartened in the situation which I am seeing. Government is a literal failure. Niraj Walia's days are full of worry and frustration. He has family in northern India. One relative died of COVID five days ago, and some of his cousins are now infected. This is me, this is my mom. He's particularly worried about his 70-year-old mother, who's isolating at home. She's not able to go outside because of that. The fear uh, may get infected. I can't even do fly. I can't even do go. And if I go, I can't help them. Because the healthcare system is on the brink of collapse. The surge of cases means the country can't care for the sick, let alone properly cremate the dead. Makeshift funeral pyres are being built around the clock. And the fear is that the death toll is much higher than what's officially being reported. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Tokyo entered a state of emergency on Sunday, just three months before the Olympics. Department stores, bars and theatres will close for 17 days ahead of a popular travel holiday. Three other regions in Japan are also under the same restrictions. Just 1% of the population is vaccinated. The loss of more than 80 lives is being mourned in Iraq today after a fire started in an ICU ward treating COVID patients. There is anger and accusations of negligence, and today the government suspended key health officials. The fire started Saturday night when an oxygen cylinder exploded in the ICU. It burned through the night, and more than 100 other people suffered injuries. Okay. All 53 crew on board an Indonesian submarine have been declared dead after underwater photos revealed wreckage on the ocean floor. The vessel went missing on Wednesday off the island of Bali. Indonesia's military says it isn't sure what caused the sinking. An Edmonton family says they want action after their 14-year-old son was attacked so viciously by fellow students he spent the night in hospital. During the attack, the students hurled racist slurs at him. We've agreed to withhold the boy's last name. Jordan Olmsted has his story and a warning. There is disturbing video of the attack. Pazzo spoke to us a week after a racist attack left him bloodied and bruised and with a concussion. The memory of his night in hospital still hazy, the vicious attack still haunting. That made me uh, afraid to wear my own skin. It happened in this field just behind where I'm standing now. Pazzo, a grade 8 student at Rosslyn Junior High, was leaving school to go catch a bus. That's when a group of students chased and tackled him to the ground. The boys called him the N-word and made monkey sounds at him, Pazzo says. Uh, I could not remember the day. Um, uh, I couldn't remember uh, that much and my head really hurt and uh, my neck. Pazzo says his attackers are friends with a student who threatened him last year and was expelled for it. When similar threats escalated this month, Pazzo was fearful, staying home for two days. When he returned, his fears came true. It was not right and it was not supposed to happen. And the school should have done something. I think I'm going to get justice with my son. This weekend, the school said, Students involved in the assault have been held accountable, but it won't say what that entailed, citing privacy laws. Advocates say the incident reaffirms the need for continued anti-racism education for staff and students. We don't want a 10-year plan. We don't want a five-year plan. It has to be in these next upcoming months to a year. Otherwise, we know it's just performative, and we're not here for that anymore. 
Police say they are investigating, but the family is upset with how they questioned Pazzo, saying the officer pressed him on whether he had started the fight. The family has stopped counting on the school for support, turning to community groups as they consider their next steps. Jordan Olmsted, CBC News, Edmonton. Video game companies have long seen teenagers as lucrative targets. Now our Go Public team has obtained an internal document from gaming giant Electronic Arts showing efforts to drive players to spend big as part of the game. And some say the temptation to spend on virtual items has links to gambling. Erica Johnson has that story. It's a video game played by tens of millions. FIFA Soccer, made by industry giant EA Electronic Arts. Embedded in the game, a mode where players can buy what's called a loot box card pack, either with coins earned in the game or with real cash. The random chance to get a better player for your team. And if you don't succeed, try, try again. Millions tune in to scenes like this. Gamers simply opening card packs, finding out what player they got. But for some people, hard to resist. I was spending probably um, 80 pounds three or four times in one night um, when the spending was at its most. Loot boxes are increasingly in the hot seat. Countries around the world are examining whether they constitute gambling. Belgium banned loot boxes in 2018. And a proposed class action in Vancouver also alleges they violate gambling laws. All prompting this insider to contact Go Public when he saw an internal EA document discussing FIFA Ultimate Team, the mode of play that features loot boxes. It says it's a cornerstone. We are doing everything we can to drive players there. And all roads lead there. Someone else is reading the insider's words. It's getting harder and harder to defend what is very obviously unregulated gambling that's meant to capitalize on people who obviously don't understand what is happening. Loot box spending is generating massive profits for EA. Its sports titles alone raked in almost one and a half billion dollars in 2020. One of the world's leading researchers on loot boxes says all the controversy points to one thing about the industry. Which is that it should no longer be trusted to self-regulate. EA declined an interview request. A spokesperson said he wouldn't comment on confidential documents and said they were being viewed without context. He did say the company doesn't believe any aspect of its video games constitutes gambling. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Go Public stories come from you, and if you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Golfer Brooke Henderson has set a new Canadian record, her 10th LPGA Tour title. Win number 10. Next, the star speaks about her momentous win. It was kind of the moment where I was like, man, I can really do this. Plus. <laughs> the steps some Canadians have taken while living with anxiety and depression made worse by the pandemic. Right. But first, stars return to the red carpet for an Oscars like none other. We're back right after this. Welcome back. Canadian tennis star Bianca Andreescu has tested positive for COVID-19. After testing negative twice before a flight to Spain, she got the news after she arrived to play in the Madrid Open. Andre Eskew told fans she's feeling good and resting, and she looks forward to getting back on the court very soon. A record-setting victory for Canadian golfer Brooke Henderson this weekend. She stormed back to take her 10th title. That's the most ever captured by a Canadian. Katie Simpson caught up with Henderson tonight. Brooke Henderson makes it look easy. Yeah, very well done. Very well done. Perfectly oh! done. A crowd wowing chip from 70 feet out. The Canadian golf star cemented her lead on the 12th hole and didn't look back. You know, right there, it was kind of the moment where I was like, man, I can really do this. And I just tried to keep that momentum going. Welcome back to your winning ways, 
With Saturday's win, her 10th on the LPGA Tour, the 23-year-old is breaking away from a distinguished crowd. She has the most title wins of any Canadian golfer, female or male. Number 10, hey, it's a great win. Um, she played well. Uh, this must reinforce and give her a lot of confidence again. Thank you. <laughs> Getting here has not been easy. The pandemic forced the tour to pause for months and Henderson's return was rocky. I've been training really hard, but without that um, competitiveness, I wasn't really where I wanted to be when I got back on tour um, last summer. I missed my first cut, and then the next week I think I finished like 50th. Um, so it wasn't exactly the start that I wanted. She says she thrives on competition. Playing against the world's best elevates her game. It helps having her sister, her caddy, by her side too, especially since her parents can't travel to see her because of COVID restrictions. You definitely miss them, um, but like I said, you know, they're healthy and they're safe and, you know, they're following the rules back home. Henderson doesn't know when she'll be able to see her parents again, but when she's on the course, she can feel their support, along with that of an entire country. I know they're all cheering for me, which is great, and I know it's really tough, um, especially back home in Canada, but, you know, stay strong and hopefully we can get through this together and hopefully soon. Henderson wants to make a habit of winning at least two tournaments per year, given that it is so early in her career and she already has the most titles. She's aiming to hold on to that record for quite some time. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. It was Hollywood's biggest night and at an unusual Oscars, an unusual order to the announcements as well, with Best Picture being handed out before the awards for Best Actor and Actress. Nomad Land taking home the top prize. We give this one to our wolf. Oh! Frances McDormand stars in the drama about a woman who travels around the American West in her van after her husband dies. McDormand also won for Best Actress. And the film's director, Chloe Zhao, became the first Asian woman to win Best Director. This is for anyone who have the faith and the courage to hold on to the goodness in themselves and to hold on to the goodness in each other, no matter how difficult it is to do that. Nine of the 20 acting nominees are people of color, and for the first time in history, a Korean actor won an Oscar. Yeo Jung Yoon took home the trophy for Best Supporting Actress in Minari. And the Academy Award for Actor goes to Anthony Hopkins, The Father. <laughs> Hopkins winning the award for his role as a man battling dementia. The prize was given right before the broadcast quickly ended. Some critics expected the late Chadwick Boseman to receive Best Actor posthumously for his role in Ma Rainey's Bottom. This year's Oscars featured no host for a third time and no audience other than the nominees due to COVID restrictions. Next to red carpet, worthy look for a vaccine clinic. One woman brings glamour to get the shot. Plus... Would it be advisable for me to be vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine as my second dose? Mixing doses and different side effects, our doctor tackles some of your vaccine questions next. Ever wondered what to wear for your COVID vaccine appointment? Well, here's the latest trend, dress your best. This Toronto woman even rented a gown for the occasion. Exposed shoulders, of course. Izzy says she wanted to capture a moment of joy from a crazy year and celebrate with her family. Two million reasons to dress up this week. That's how many vaccine doses Canada expects to receive, including the first shipment of the single-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine, along with one million Pfizer and 650,000 from Moderna. That's half a million fewer, though, than originally promised due to Moderna's production troubles in Europe. So as more Canadians roll up their sleeves to get their shots, some still have questions about vaccines. So let's get right to them with infectious disease specialist, Dr. Alex Wong, who is in Regina. And Dr. Wong, let's start with the side effects of getting vaccinated. Uh, we got this question. Are there more general side effects with the AstraZeneca vaccine than Pfizer or Moderna? Thanks, Ian. So uh, great question. In, in short, uh, there's no 
evidence per se to support that AstraZeneca has any additional or more side effects or more severe side effects than either of the mRNA vaccines. The most common side effects include fatigue, headache, fevers, aches and pains. Uh, those usually go away in a couple of days. Uh, so if you get those types of side effects, uh, taking a bit of Tylenol and ibuprofen to help will make it uh, go away a bit quicker. Some people, Dr. Wong, are wondering about mixing vaccines. Here's a question we got on video. I was vaccinated with my first dose of the Moderna vaccine on April 10th. I'm going to be 50 this year. My question is, would it be advisable for me to be vaccinated with the AstraZeneca vaccine as my second dose? Dr. Wong, uh, what do you know about that? So there's not a lot of true sort of clinical trial evidence right now to support sort of uh, mixing and matching uh, vaccines routinely. Uh, I think a lot of what's going to happen is probably going to end up being dictated to some degree by supply and demand of what's available. Uh, that being said, the current guidance is still, if at all possible, to try and have a second dose of vaccine, which is identical to the first dose that you received. Dr. Wong, on Friday on The National, Bonnie Allen told us the heartbreaking story of Warren Montgomery, a well-known entrepreneur in Regina who recently died from COVID complications. I want to play an excerpt from that. This is his wife talking about fatigue over COVID restrictions. I was sick of everything. Open it up. I, I was done. I wanted my family back. I wanted my get-togethers back. I wanted my friends back like everybody. And I, I was vocal about it. I couldn't have been more wrong. Dr. Wong, you're on call today. Well, what should we know about what's going on in your community? You know, everybody in the community is tired. At the same time, our ICUs are overflowing, packed to the brim. People are being double bunked into rooms. Uh, procedures are being canceled. So it really is a crisis. And, uh, you know, I feel at times like in this province, we've at times reduced the pandemic to dashboard statistics. And it's really about people, people like Warren Montgomery who died tragically. Uh, people like, uh, you know, people in our ICU right now, there was a gentleman uh, who was in our ICU and his wife delivered their baby daughter by C-section, for example. I mean, these sorts of stories are happening every day. And so I just want people to remember that this pandemic is not about statistics and numbers. It's about real people and real lives. And we need to do everything possible in terms of the economic and mandated measures necessary in order to bring this curve down in this province as quickly and as aggressively as possible so we can avoid more deaths and more suffering. I know this is a busy time for you, uh, Dr. Wong. Thank you very much for, for making some time for us. Always a pleasure, Ian. Thank you. For many Canadians, one big side effect of the pandemic itself has been a harsh impact on mental health. Whether it's depression, anxiety or stress, living through more than a year of crisis can take a high toll. Tonight, three Canadians share their stories and what works for them. <laughs> Tap your shower just to the point where you can get it to start. And that's the coldest. <laughs> that it's like a challenge for me to stay under. <sighs> I'm going home. Just being present. Just can't really do much else but think about how cold it is. Use this to focus. Use this to come back into the present moment because it's so freaking cold. Literally, I tell myself, if I can start my day with the hardest thing physically, the rest of my day is incredibly easy. And yeah, that's uh, feeling feeling awake, feeling alive, feeling accomplished. Because that's the hardest thing I usually do to start my morning. I get anxious like first thing in the morning. I would call it my daily ambush where I would wake up but I'd be so tired from not sleeping properly that I wouldn't want to get up. But as I try to go back to sleep, I would just simply close my eyes and my mind would just be racing. I was trying everything and uh, I had read about cold showers from someone that it helps reduce anxiety. This is one of the things that helped me get through some really difficult times. That cold shower sets the tone for the rest of my day. After I had my daughter 18 months ago, I suffered from some pretty bad postpartum anxiety. Well, the main thing for me when I was kind of in the worst of it was making sure that I just had a routine. And then part of the routine is outdoor time, going outside for a nice walk. 
We live out in Lanark Highlands, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's very wooded where we are. We're lucky enough to have some trails that were made on the property um, that deer also like to use. Little rabbit tracks in the, in the winter, you can see all the animals. And you can just hear the wind. Oh, you can just like feel the trees like breathing. It sounds weird, but like it's definitely like having a nature bath. We have a toddler, so it takes a long time to walk places. She takes little steps and we take little steps. Being outside with the chicken and the guinea hens, it's fun for my daughter. And when I see her laugh, that makes me happy. So doing things that make you happy during the day and that fill you up are really important. The thing was I was probably dealing with the, this anxiety from the moment she was born. The anxiousness is kind of brushed off as normal feelings of just being an anxious new mom. It wasn't until I had my first panic attack that it really clicked with me that I was probably struggling with something a little more intense than just the run of the mill. I'm 57 years old. I suffer from depression since I was 33. I couldn't wake up, get out of the bed. I couldn't walk. During this time, I had a friend introducing me a book called One Minute Gratitude Journal. This is my beautiful One Minute Gratitude Journal. This one is the first one. Take you a couple minutes to write down three to five things you are grateful uh, for the day. Number one, so happy to enter into my cleaning mood. Can you believe cleaning can be happy actually? Even a very simple thing. Sewing for Ryan and Andrew. I'm happy working with my hand. Worked a long hour for 400 mini sandwiches with tofu and snail. And uh, gradually, it's magic is happening. It's a feeling, appreciate, and then it cultivate an attitude. I finally feel alive. And I figure out it's by doing this day to day. It's become a choice to be determined to be happy, only remember the happy thing. It's very powerful. And the other thing, I joined this uh, happy old uh, club, actually. It's a cushioning club, repeating the things, one needle at a time, one needle at a time, and then graduate, and you have a product coming out. It's a satisfying feeling in the end. The best advice I could give to someone who's struggling with their mental health right now is you really got to focus on what you can control and you have to practice being positive. You're not entitled to being happy. You have to work to be happy. I would say that you really need to take a moment for yourself during a day and give yourself grace. The most helpful thing that someone told me during this experience was like on an airplane. If your airplane's going down or the oxygen mask drops, you put it on yourself first before you put it on somebody else. And I told myself, I know I be there, I done that. I know no matter how deep I I down there before and I come out of it. I'm not scary anymore. It's a physical illness, or it's a mental illness. It's a illness you just need to take care of it. There are lots of small businesses just hanging on, and for some, this week's massive federal budget was a lifeline. The extension of SIRS was like the Maple Leafs winning in overtime in Game 7. But others question the mounting debt. Stay with us. Welcome back. A woman in the Northwest Territories is sharing her story with us tonight in the hope that it brings change. People in many parts of the territory are experiencing a housing crisis. Many homes are in dire need of repair. But as Anna Demaris shows us, money intended for some of the most vulnerable isn't getting to them. 
they'll come up about this high, maybe five, five boxes on top of one another. Elizabeth Hardesty spent five years of her life fitting boxes of medical supplies into every nook and cranny of her small home. They were for her husband, Percy, who had end-stage renal failure. All the equipment needed for his care turned their home into an obstacle course. All we had was like four feet, you know, little alleys in our house. Towards the end, like when he was uh, losing his, you know, sense of balance and mobility, I was quite concerned. Percy died waiting for a home renovation that could have drastically improved his quality of life. The Hardesties couldn't afford to pay for a small room addition to store Percy's necessities. So they asked the NWT Housing Corporation for a loan, but Hardesty says they never heard back. Well, it just kind of, you know, makes you want to give up. In the Northwest Territories, stories like this are common. Most homes in small communities are owned by the territorial government and managed by the Housing Corporation. Almost half are in dire need of repair. But despite many funding programs, few get the upgrades they need. So there is good reason, Mr. Speaker, for the centrality of housing. There is no good reason, Mr. Speaker, that we are not providing it. Last month, the legislature launched a review of the Housing Corporation's policies, but it will take months to complete. You know, we deal with this on a daily basis. Advocates say the territory needs to keep the agency accountable. Because there really isn't any kind of independent type of oversight where people can actually bring their concerns. The Housing Corporation says anyone needing help should go to their district office. Hardesty says that's not enough. She wants a dedicated representative to help people navigate the complicated system in the hopes that other families don't struggle in their homes the way her husband did in his final days. Anna Demarest, CBC News, Fort Simpson, Northwest Territories. The financial pressure of the pandemic has played out across the country. With that in mind, this week's massive federal budget extended several pandemic funding programs and promised billions more in future spending. But while some applaud keeping those taps open, others have serious concerns about mounting debt. Nick Purden introduces us to three Canadians with very different reactions to their federal budget. It's dire. I can't reduce and cut costs any more than I have. Mike Jaworski is in survival mode. He runs his pizza restaurant as best he can these days. I had five employees, they've all been laid off. Uh, I do 100% of the work, accounting, ordering, cooking, answering the phones, and it's still not making a profit. Uh, so why keep doing it? I don't understand what I'm, why I'm breaking my back when I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. That was the mindset Mike was in when he sat down to watch the budget. I'm not a political guy. I'm, I'm, I'm just a hardworking, just average Joe. So it was weird for me to really be watching every word when that budget came out. It was kind of like game seven of like Maple Leafs versus the Montreal Canadiens in Stanley Cup final, like game seven in third period. I was waiting for it. I was watching every moment of it. What Mike was looking for specifically was a continuation of the emergency rent subsidy or SERS. That keeps the door open here. And he got it. I was elated. I almost was screaming because it, without that, I already was planning on June 5th closing. It was just, I, I wasn't going to make enough money out of my own pocket to pay rent. The extension of SIRS was like, like the Maple Leafs winning in overtime in Game 7 for me. That allows me the opportunity to maybe weather this storm. And that's one of the ideas behind the budget to help people like Mike get their business through the pandemic. But of course, there's a cost. Canada's deficit is projected to be $354 billion, and the debt, $1.4 trillion by 2026. I understand debt. I have seen every aspect of debt. Debt for successful investments and debt that drove people into despair. I've seen it all. That's Ron Butler. In his 25 years as a mortgage broker, he's seen the way we think about debt change, big time. We used to worry a lot about a $38 billion deficit in this country. There was all kinds of discussion about it. So now we're running 10 times that, 10 times. And I don't hear very much concern from anyone about it. 
what's changed from sweating about 38 billion to 10 times that? Certainly COVID happened. That's a big change. Uh, there was such a need to get money to people who'd lost their jobs that a big deficit was expected. So we did go into a $345 billion deficit last year. The sky didn't fall in. I mean, not, nothing went too wrong. So why not just do it again? Uh, we'll see how this rides out. Ron says he sees the same spending behavior that the government's doing with everyday people. He says we've forgotten the risk of taking on too much debt. That's exactly what happens in the mortgage business. If people refi their homes once, it was a somewhat larger payment, maybe about the same payment because rates went down. Well, let's do it again. Rates are even lower. Let's refinance again. Let's get a bigger mortgage. Let's renovate the basement. Let's do this. Let's do that. Until the day comes when it doesn't work out anymore. If I had grandchildren, what am I saddling them with? You can argue about money for the present crisis versus future debt. But for someone like Aziki Yui, there's no debate. Every month she risks being evicted. It's stressful because I've missed a month. I've got the notices at my door. You're late. You can be evicted. Aziki's a mom of three. Before the pandemic, she was a cleaner. But in the last year since COVID, she's only been able to work twice. And she says CERB is not enough. When it comes to paying the rent or buying food, it's a toss up. I have to be thinking if I'm going to pay the rent or if I'm going to buy food, if I'm going to be able to feed my children or I'm going to be evicted. So it's not a nice feeling when you have to be thinking about one or the other. Aziki tells me that for her, the budget was a disappointment. I don't think the budget has done enough. The budget has not done enough to cover our needs. And I don't think that they even consulted with us. What do you need? What, what can we do for you? How does this budget will help you? When you're in low income, you're not able to say, oh, the budget is too much, you know, there's a deficit. We understand that there's a deficit, but right now we need the assistance. Aziki wants to get back to work and support herself. But for now, because of COVID, she's stuck. And that's the case for thousands of Canadians across the country. Mike's in the same boat. He hates that he can't support himself, that he needs government help to stay open. The reason why I'm here and the reason why I'm passionate about the budget is to, to feed my family, to make sure that they're, they're safe, they're sheltered, they're fed, um, keep them comfortable. I mean, this is the only reason why I'm here. And uh, I, I, again, I don't know how long I can do that. And that's what the real scary part is. After more than a year of COVID, the only thing we know is that the future is uncertain. And a budget all by itself can't put an end to that. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. A music school aims to spread a little joy. The little orchestra that emerged from four Ontario high-rise towers. Our moment is next. These two kids are part of a program called Music at the Towers in Brampton, Ontario. It provides dozens of kids in four apartment buildings access to instruments and music lessons. They've been learning how to play in an orchestra. But performing in a pandemic means no audience. So another program was born called Spread the Joy. The kids took their new talents to Zoom, sometimes by phone as well, to play for local seniors locked down. And all of that is our moment. Our bass teacher mentioned this idea and that he was thinking of doing this. And I just said, that is just the most fantastic idea. We should try it. Some of the adults are very, uh, are very good at just sharing, you know, time with the children. It's just fun being able to share music with like other people. And it just feels good to be doing that. And I like doing it because we get to just get to know other people. And while we're doing it, we have fun doing it and bringing the joy to other people. It gives us something to think about. When we're in lockdown, we don't have a lot to think about. Uh, 
other than grumble. <laughs> I think people living in seniors' homes are around seniors all the time and not so many little ones and young ones. So I think that's the thing that makes it refreshing. And both parts of that program are fantastic, right? First of all, just making music available to lots of kids who might not otherwise get a chance to do that. It reminds me when I was in junior high school, we had a music teacher a long time ago in New Brunswick who put band instruments in the hands of all these kids who, who had never played an instrument before and had loved it. And some of them ended up playing for the rest of their lives. And then add to that the connection to seniors born out of the pandemic, but really hopefully will continue long after things are back to normal. That is The National for April 25th. Good night.